And now, without further ado, I would like to turn today's time over to our presenter, Rick Garcia, who works with the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center. Rick? Hey, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, Denise, I'm going to turn my camera on just for the introduction, and then I'll turn it off. But hi, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here. Um, I want to thank Roxanne and Denise for inviting me again to kind of talk with everyone about VAWA, um, the Violence Against Women Act. If you guys know me, you know that I love talking about VAWA and I probably talk about it in my sleep, but um, I want to just kind of say hello to everyone. I'm actually um, not in my home office. I'm downtown in Anchorage at the Sheridan. And so I'm going to turn my video off because I think that it may get a little spotty with the internet. Um, but let me see if I can share my screen first. Okay, Denise, can you guys see my presentation? I can see your presentation. It's um, okay. in regular mode. Okay. There you go. Well, I think that, let me just see. Okay, so I'm going to turn my camera off. Okay, thanks, Francis. Okay, so um, hello again, everyone. I want to take an opportunity to kind of introduce myself for those that don't know me. Um, my name is Rick Garcia. And I serve as the co-director of law and policy for the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center, uh, which is based out of Air, uh, Fairbanks, Alaska, but I'm here in Anchorage. Um, I've been an attorney for about 13 years, and I'm licensed in the state courts of Alaska um, and also in Florida. Um, and I moved to Alaska, geez, I think next month it's going to be six years already, which is hard to believe. But... Um, I moved here in 2018 in January. Um, I got off a plane from Miami and flip flops in Bethel. Um, and I was able to begin my journey working with Alaska tribes at ABCP in the early years, um, where I served as their associate general counsel and also served as their tribal justice director. Um, when I left ABCP, I moved from Bethel and I moved to Antioch, um, just up the river from Bethel. And I was, you know, had the opportunity to serve as a district court magistrate judge for the Alaska court system. Um, so I was hearing a lot of hearings um, based out of River Bay and out of Antioch. And then finally, I moved to Anchorage and uh, began working with ANJC and then also now working with the Resource Center. Um, happy to say that most of my time in Alaska, with the exception of my short um, career, if you say that, at the state court system, um, has really been spent working with Alaska Native tribes, tribal courts, tribal justice systems, um, helping tribes to reinvigorate um, and reestablish their tribal justice systems so that we're relying less and less on our state courts um, that have historically failed Alaska Natives particularly. I'm so happy to say that's really what I'm doing at the Resource Center right now. A lot of my work focuses on federal policy initiatives. So we are looking at how um, some of the policies from the federal government um, are impacting Alaska Native tribes. Um, and so we're recommending things to the federal government about that. Um, and the other part of that, which is the part that I absolutely love, is, is doing what I'm doing today, is talking with everyone about tribal justice related issues, kind of sharing the knowledge that I've been able to gain and over the last six years, and, and, and really just to be a sounding board for tribes to kind of bounce their questions off and for technical assistance. I want to talk a little bit about the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center before we dive into the presentation. Um, but the Alaska Native Women's Resource Center, or AKNWRC, had, was formally established in 2015. Um, and at the time, um, back in the early 2000s and the 2010s, there were lots of focuses on um, justice-related aspects for Alaska Native tribes. Um, and so what we realized or what our executive director um, and our board of directors realized very quickly was that there wasn't a dedicated Alaska Native Tribal Resource Center that was providing training and technical assistance to our tribal advocates. And so those may be our survivor advocates, our victim advocates, our legal advocates. Um, but those frontline workers that are providing that immediate and long-term planning to our survivors of gender-based violence in our tribal communities was something that was recognized as a need. And so happy to report that since 2015 that AKNWRC has really grown to be um, the Alaska um, 
tribal based nonprofit organization that focuses on survivor safety. Um, and we do that in a really unique way. Uh, we not only address programming and provide technical assistance to tribes and tribal organizations um, on the tribal level, but through our work with the law and policy team, we're able to provide that holistic um, view of justice for Alaska tribes and provide them assistance with their tribal justice capacity building efforts, with their tribal courts, um, and with their law enforcement and responses. Um, ACAN WC is the only Alaska-based member of the Domestic Violence Resource Network, and so we're mainly funded through the Family Violence and Prevention Services Act through HHS. Um, but um, I put the slide up here just to let folks know that if there's anything that tribes need, uh, whether it be related to domestic violence, uh, whether it relates to any gender based violence, to your survivor services programming, all the way through your tribal justice programming. Um, and if we can help you out, please reach out to us. Um, the work we do at the Resource Center is always collaborative. It's always led by what a tribe or community needs first. And then we provide our recommendations, technical assistance. Um, and that can look like a whole lot of different ways. Um, we have tribes that call us daily or email us daily about certain questions they have about how to process things at the tribal level, and we're able to help them out. Um, we also do a lot of long term planning with tribes on both their social services, their victim services, and the tribal justice related aspects of programming at your local tribal level. So again, um, if we can help out, please let us know. Um, we do a lot of work with Roxanne and Denise in the YK region. And um, of course, the YK has my heart because that's where I started in Alaska. So moving on, enough about me and about the Resource Center. But um, as Denise mentioned, this is really part one of two trainings. And so I was really mindful about not overloading everybody today with a lot of information. Um, but this is going to be in two parts. And so today, what we're going to cover is I wanted to start off the presentation talking about Public Law 280. Um, and its practical effect in Alaska. And that might be a, a weird place to start when we're talking about VAWA, but I think it's important because um, the unique nuances of what Public Law 280 did and its jurisdictional and legal effect in Alaska is unique to Alaska because Alaska is unique when we think about the rest of the lower 48. Um, so I wanted to start there. Uh, we're also gonna talk about the history of the Violence Against Women Act and talk about the previous reauthorizations and what they did to strengthen tribal sovereignty and tribal capacity. Uh, and then, of course, we're going to move into the 2022 reauthorization of VAWA, which was really historic, especially for Alaska. Um, and then that's going to be the end of today's training. Um, of course, some Q&A. And then next week, we're going to focus a lot on the Alaska Pilot Project, a lot on what tribes in Alaska are doing regarding criminal jurisdiction and talk about criminal law, um, just some basics briefly. Um, but I wanna say that if anyone has any questions throughout the presentation today, please feel free to stop me. Um, we have a nice small group today, which is awesome. Um, and so if there are any questions, please just feel free to interrupt me. Um, if that screen isn't up on my, my, my computer, then just let me know to stop talking and, and please ask away. Um, I always find that the most um, beneficial trainings that I go to are the ones that are most collaborative and that if one of you has a question, there is a strong chance that somebody else is thinking that same question. So please feel free to ask. I'm always happy to help out. Okay, so I wanted to talk um, first, like I mentioned, we're going to talk about Public Law 280. And this is really important because I think that um, since statehood um, for Alaska and Alaska tribes, we've had to navigate this complex jurisdictional landscape because of Public Law 280. Um, and I think that the effect that it has in Alaska is going to be similar to downstate tribes that are mandatory Public Law 280 states. But again, there are certain nuances that Alaska tribes that we have to consider, um, particularly the way that our land claims were settled, um, that impacts um, how we work through and with um, our state government because of Public Law 280. But um, let me get started on Public Law 280. So at the very beginning, Public Law 280, um, commonly referred to as PL 280, um, it was a 1953 federal law that really sought to promote state authority 
within Indian country. And the practical effect, effect of it is that it transferred legal jurisdiction from the federal government to certain state governments over most crimes um, that occurred in Indian country. Um, if you remember a crime, of course, we're all familiar with the crime, so that, but so that we're all sharing the same definition. Um, a crime is a violation of some type of law that either results in someone being sent to prison or jail or has the possibility of someone being sent to prison or jail. Um, and so when we think about Alaska and we think about ANCSA and we think about the way that um, land claims, um, indigenous land claims were settled in Alaska, we all know that with the exception of Metlakatla, there is only one, uh, there are no other reservation based lands in Alaska. And what I mean by that is if we look at the downstate tribes, there's a lots of examples of reservations. Um, and on those reservation lands in, let's say, um, non-public law 280 state, if a crime to occur on Indian country or reservation land, then there's really two sovereigns that have the authority to um, respond to that. Of course, the first would be the tribal governments. Um, and then the second would be the federal government. And the federal government's obligation comes through that trust responsibility that we have with the, um, our federal government. Uh, which may come through either laws or it could come through treaties. Um, the challenging part about Alaska, which we all know because we all live it, again, is that the way that land claims were settled, um, indigenous land claims, um, that Metlakatla, because they have a reservation-based land, they're the only um, federally defined Indian country in Alaska. So that means what happens in Metlakatla or what should happen in Metlakatla is if there is a crime that has occurred on the Metlakatla reservation, the two sovereign bodies or the two sovereign governments that have the authority to respond to that are the Metlakatla tribal government and the um, federal government because it's reservation. Um, and so what it did for Alaska, what Public Law 280 did for Alaska, it is it, it, it gave um, jurisdiction to the state of Alaska government um, to be able to prosecute criminally um, crimes that occur in Alaska Native villages. Um, so it also gave shared jurisdiction for certain civil cases between the Alaska state courts and the tribal governments of Alaska. Um, and that is referred to as concurrent jurisdiction, which is something that you may have heard um, in some of Denise's and Roxanne's past trainings. Um, but concurrent essentially means that both the tribe and the state of Alaska here in Alaska have jurisdiction over criminal cases and some civil matters. Um, and so let me give you an example. So let's say that we're sitting in um, Akyak, right? Native Village of Akyak. Um, because Alaska is a mandatory public law 280 state, today, if a crime were to occur in Akyak, the two governments that can respond to that crime are um, the Akyak government, and also the state of Alaska. Um, that's only because of Public Law 280 in Alaska. Um, if there were, if this were a reservation-based land state, um, if Alaska were like the Lower 48, and let's say Akyak had reservations like Lower 48 tribes, then the only two people that could respond would be the federal government and the Akyak government. Um, so I want to pause because that was a lot of information. So I want to see if there's any questions about what was shared or if anybody noticed if, if, any corrections either too. Yeah, I just, on. oh, go ahead. I heard Daisy May. Your Honor. Hi, Daisy May. Good afternoon. You had uh, mentioned the difference between reservations and tribal governance. Is it my understanding, although we some villages may not be a reservation, however, VAWA can be implemented through the Tribal Sovereign Council with under Civil Act law, right? Correct. Yes, Daisy. Yep, exactly right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to um, 
Oh, sorry, I wasn't checking. Were there any more questions? Okay. So I wanted to kind of provide just a quick chart of what Public Law 280 did and what it didn't do. And this is particular to Alaska. Um, it may apply, uh, it certainly can apply to downstate tribes that are in Public Law 280 states, but this is really for Alaska. So um, I want to start off on the right column, what it didn't do. Um, so you'll hear, um, maybe you've heard it before, that Public Law 280 ended the trust relationship over sovereign immunity of tribes. That is not true. Public Law 280 did not affect the trust relationship that tribes enjoy with the federal government, um, and it did not remove or did not um, affect at all tribes' sovereign immunity. Um, it did not terminate tribes. It did not extinguish tribal sovereignty. It did not take away tribal jurisdiction. Uh, Public Law 280 did not affect the trust status of Indian lands. Um, and it did not exclude um, Alaska Natives in Public Law 280 states from receiving benefits under federal Indian programs. If you look at the left side, um, of course, what it did do, and we talked about this just a few minutes ago, is that it did extend criminal jurisdiction to state governments um, where states did not have the authority to prosecute on um, on Indian lands prior. Um, tribal, state, and federal governments, they share that concurrent criminal jurisdiction. And we see that here in Alaska. Um, in the Akyak example, you know, if a crime occurs in Akyak, uh, the Akyak tribal government can respond. Um, because Alaska is a public law 280 state, the state of Alaska government can respond. And because there are some major crimes where the federal government does not give jurisdiction to the states, uh, there may be some major crimes where the federal government can also. Um, the practical effect, and I think this is really important as we start to, you know, develop our tribal justice systems, as we start to look at um, what happened for Alaska tribes. Um, and it's that third point is that Public Law 280 did decrease financial resources from the federal government to tribes. Um, because in Public Law 280 states, those go to the state, um, which have resulted in underfunded tribal criminal justice systems and tribal justice systems across the board. And we really have seen this in Alaska. Uh, we've seen where the public safety and justice funding from our federal government um, for the first 50 or so years of the state government has really gone to the state. Uh, we know that the state's ability to provide effective and comprehensive public safety to all of Alaska, including all of the Alaska Native tribes that we have, um, that the state has failed. Um, we also know that since 2016, that there's been some dedicated funding to support Alaska Native tribal justice systems, uh, mainly coming from BIA, uh, but that there are also some competitive grants. But when we talk um, with our federal partners, when we talk with our downstage tribes, and we explain to them about the infrastructure that is needed in Alaska for our tribes, um, a lot of the questions that we receive are, well, why is that? And this is really why. Um, it's because Public Law 280, because the federal government um, streamlined public safety and justice funding, um, not to our tribal governments in Alaska, but to our state government in Alaska. And I wanted to end this particular section talking about the Oliphant decision. Um, for those who don't know about the Oliphant decision, it was um, it's, it's been a really terrible headache for um, not only Alaska Native tribes, but American Indian tribes since 1978. Um, so the case, this uh, the case Oliphant versus the Quamish, um, it started out as a tribal court case. It got appealed through the state court in Washington, and it ended up before the um, United States Supreme Court in the 1970s. Um, and what happened was Suquamish, uh, I'm sorry, Oliphant was a non-tribal citizen um, and he violated um, the Suquamish tribe's laws, essentially. And so the Suquamish tribe prosecuted, there were two non-Indians, um, Oliphant was one, um, and they were the residents of the Port Madison Reservation. Um, one was charged with assaulting a tribal officer and resisting arrest, and the other was charged with recklessly endangering another person and injuring tribal property after an alleged, um, it was a high speed race on reservation highways. Um, so the Suquamish Indian tribe prosecuted these two non-Indians criminally, brought them up in tribal court. Um, and in tribal court, the two defendants um, who were again, non-native, they sought what's called a habeas corpus relief from the federal court. 
arguing that the tribe lacked criminal jurisdiction over non-Indians such as themselves. Um, and so a habeas corpus petition is just a fancy term, essentially, that defendants um, will file when they're in custody asking a federal court to review whether or not the entity um, or the agency that is holding them um, has the authority to do so. So what Oliphant and his co-conspirator did in this case is they filed a habeas petition with the federal district court saying, hey, federal district court, we've been, we're being held by the Suquamish Indian tribe, and we don't think they have jurisdiction because we're non-native. Um, although um, through this procedure, through this process, and through the arguments of Oliphant, um, the lower courts rejected their arguments. So the lower federal courts found that no, um, sorry, Oliphant, the Suquamish Indian tribe does have uh, jurisdiction criminally over you, even though you're non-native. Um, but unfortunately, the United States Supreme Court in 1978, they did not agree. Um, and so what they decided in, 1970, in 1978 was that Indian tribes can no longer prosecute criminally non-Indians for behavior that occur on their reservations. Um, and so what this means that after this ruling, after the highest court in our land has said um, Indian tribes do not have criminal jurisdiction over non-Native offenders, um, what we saw from 1978 until the better part of 2013 is that um, if your state government was not picking up these non-Native offenders that were committing crimes on Indian reservations, or if the federal government was not picking up these non-Native offenders, we were seeing large and wide that the offenders were largely going unpunished. Um, again, they were committing crimes on Indian reservations, um, oftentimes or most times involving an Indian or a Native victim, survivor, um, but that the state and federal prosecutions were very small in number. Um, and this went on from 1978 all the way until 2013 in the one of the reauthorization reauthorizations of the Violence Against Women Act. Um, so this problem, this, this um, removal of a tribe's authority to protect its tribal citizens, to protect its communities, um, specifically against non-native offenders, it was a problem. It was a problem particularly um, disturbing when we think about the context of domestic violence. Um, you know, there have been studies that show that 67% of sexual abuse and related offenses committed in Indian country. Um, and these are just during the years of 2005 to 2009. So for a period of four years, 67% of the um, offenses committing in the country were left unprosecuted by the federal government. Um, and so this was a real problem again from 1978 to 2013, but it's part of the problem that was created by a ruling of our United States Supreme Court that VAWA has sought to kind of overcome. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, here in Alaska, of course, we know that our Alaska Native women, our American Native women, um, they are not only victimized um, at rates that are disproportionate to their non-Native counterparts, women. <clears throat> but there's also this problem that has been very prevalent in Alaska for at least the ten, last 10 years, where uh, the homicide rate of Alaska Native and American Indian women are sometimes two or three times that the rate of um, non-Indigenous women in Alaska. And I, so I wanted to kind of uplift um, this study, this Homicide of Alaska Women. Um, this was a study that was done by the Violence Policy Center. Um, and that is a national education organization that really works for what they quote unquote say a safer America. Uh, they do that through a number of different initiatives, um, including research, investigation, analysis. And they also do it through these published reports. Um, and so they have taken some data, they've reviewed data from 2005 to 2020. And I apologize, there's an updated report that just came out last month that I, I didn't put in here, but I will for future presentations. Um, what they found in Alaska um, was that Alaska was experiencing um, what they consider a prolonged epidemic of deadly violence against women. Uh, for instance, in 2020, and on the screen there, you can see the rate of homicide uh, the blue on the bottom 
is the national average. And the red that you see that goes up, down, up, down, and then continually increasing, um, that is the rate of homicide of Alaska women here in Alaska. Um, they found that in 2020, Alaska had the highest homicide rate in the United States for female victims killed by their male offenders. Um, and that Alaska has either ranked first or second in the nation um, in the rate of women killed by men for 10 years in a row. And you can really see that in the graph on the screen. So from 2010, you know, Alaska's statistics kind of aligned with the national average. But since 2010, there's been a, an incline, an increase in the prevalence of homicide of Alaska Native women, um, specifically in Alaska, that has propelled Alaska to a place where we don't want to be known for, which is, um, you know, first in the United States for a homicide of Alaska women um, and incidents involving male um, offenders. Um, so to put it in context, Alaska's rate of women killed by men is three and a half per 100,000 women, um, which is over two and a half times the average for 2020 um, of 1.34 for women. And of course, we know that um, this doesn't, um, we're not looking at this in a silo, we're not looking at this in a box. Uh, we know that American Indian and Alaska Native women, again, were disproportionately impacted by violence in Alaska. Um, and we know that their crisis against women in Alaska, um, particularly against our American Indian and Alaska Native women, um, that it is seeing some increase in visibility, some increase in program development from our federal government and funding streams, but that it continues to remain and it should be a top priority for our lawmakers, not only in the state, but in our federal governments. Um, and I put some links there. The source of this, again, the title of the study is called When Men Work Murder Women. Um, I know that some of our tribes work down states. We have uh, tribal citizens and members that live in other parts of the state, but there is a link for that. Um, it has an analysis of homicide data by state. So if we have tribes that have um, folks in other states, this may be something good to look at. Um, I always want to highlight this too because I think it's a really good resource for those of us that are looking to get additional funding for our tribal justice systems. Um, it is a very solid foundational research study to quote um, that will provide additional data. Okay, so the problem that we know all about um, why VAWA was necessary here in Alaska, again, it relates back to the Oliphant decision. Uh, where Alaska tribes are not able to exercise criminal jurisdiction over their non-native offenders. Um, and so I um, want to start talking about the Violence Against Women Act. Um, for those who don't know, the Violence Against Women Act, we'll refer to as VAWA throughout the rest of the presentation, um, but it was first enacted in 1994. Um, and I always get kind of dumbfounded by the state because as we know, America was founded in 1776. So from 1776 to 1994, um, that's over 200 years, right, of the United States becoming a country. That's more than 400 years of the United States dominating and um, and you know committing genocide against Alaska Native American Indian tribes, taking of their land, uh, the violence committed against their women and children. Um, but in 1994, the first Violence Against Women Act was passed. Um, what is historic about this act is a few things. Um, it is the first time um, in 1984, again, over 200 years since uh, America was founded as a country, where it became a federal crime um, to batter um, an intimate partner, where domestic violence became a crime. So from 1776 until 1993, if you committed domestic violence federally, federal prosecutors could not charge you because it wasn't on the books. Um, it may have led to an instance where it may have been in, in an enhanced type of crime because there were domestic violence that was involved. Um, but what that meant was that, again, if your state or your tribal governments um, before Oliphant, um, for those non-Native offenders that were committing these um, violent crimes against Alaska Native American Indian women on reservations, if your state governments or your tribal governments didn't pick those up for prosecution, um, offenders were largely going unpunched. Um, and it left them with a sense of feeling emboldened. Um, again, we saw from 1994 to 2013, 
that crimes increased, that prosecutions decreased, um, and that resources were needed for Alaska Native American Indian tribes and communities to really combat this. Um, but so VAWA, um, it, again, is the first time that domestic violence was recognized as a federal crime under federal law. Um, other things that it did, it um, created the Office for Violence Against Women, which is um, a lot of where Alaska tribes are getting their tribal justice funding from and survivor services funding from um, is through OBW. And so VAWA created OBW as the federal agency that is charged with not only implementing out the provisions and purpose of the Violence Against Women Act, but also creating those internal federal systems and departments to help them. So that's why we see OBW. Um, something else that it did, it also created um, these annual government to government consultations. So section 903 of the original VAWA Act in 1984 mandated that, um, that the federal government have annual government to government consultations about OVW and the programs and funding streams that it is administering. And so for those that remember, this year's OVW consultation was in Tulsa during the summer. And last year it was in Anchorage for the first time ever. And so um, those are really two key things that occurred in 1994 VAWA. Um, the Violence Against Women Act, it has been reauthorized four times since 94. Uh, it's been reauthorized 2000, 2005, 2013, and most recently in 2022. And so each reauthorization um, has really strengthened the overall effectiveness of the Violence Against Women Act. And at least since 2005, um, we have seen that the Violence Against Women Act have really enhanced um, safety, has increased access to resources and programming for Alaska Native and American Indian tribes to combat domestic violence dating 